Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's uh, really a great thing to be together this morning and talking about something that is not uh, a fringe issue. A verse that has become more of a life verse than I wish is in Psalm chapter 37, where David, toward the end of his life, writes these words in verse 25. I once was young and now I'm old. Anybody feel that? Yeah. Here, here's David. The vantage point of wisdom looking back on my life. Here's what he said. I've never seen the righteous going hungry or their seed, their children begging bread. He's always generous and lends freely. His children will be a blessing. Friends, this uh, weekend of conversation about generosity is not a tangential issue because when David says righteousness, now don't be put off by a Sunday school word that doesn't seem to fall into our normal conversation. Real simply, righteousness is doing the right thing. And God always does the right thing. And when we read the scriptures and discover the big picture of life, even higher than the Bible at 30,000 feet, the, the span of history says God always does the right thing. And since the garden, man always does the wrong thing. And so God invaded history through his son, the Lord Jesus, to make it possible for us to become the daughters and sons of God who could become like the father and the son in learning how to live doing the right thing. When we live doing the right thing, we are by definition righteous. And when we are doing the wrong thing, we're by definition failing to live up to the family model that is now within reach for us if we choose it. If you had to sit down and just kind of get a piece of paper and write down, what are the top indicators of righteousness? I suspect that it's possible that our top of the list would not be the same as God's. When David, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give us Psalm 37, answers that question, here's what he says. The number one indicator of righteousness, in my view, is generosity. The most memorized verse of the Bible. What do you think it is? I'm guessing John 3, 16. God so loved that he gave. That's right. (laughs) And, And here's what happened from there. The father generously gave his son, and then his son generously gave his life. He said of himself, I've not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. God the Father, generous. God the Son, generous. We, the daughters and sons of God, who will we be? I want to think with you about that today, how to live rich now and how to be rich later. Let me think first with you about the pursuit for our lives. What are we here for? What what is our life in toto supposed to be? A great source for that will be the Apostle Paul. I'm opening to Romans chapter 12. Boy, it's hard in one message with a countdown clock to think in big terms because For 11 chapters, Paul has just written what may be the most concise statement of the belief system of the Christian faith, presenting man in sin, God in generous love, presenting the opportunity for by grace through faith, through no act of our own, no work on our part, earning or deserving the redemption that is ours in Christ. We now live and breathe to manifest God's plan in and through us. Is that a good thing? In spite of weather canceled balloon fiestas, is that enough for a faith fiesta? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Paul says that's all great information for 11 chapters, but he's not done yet. 
Chapter 12 answer, opens with a therefore. Here's our problem, friends. Sometimes we can come to our faith experience and think it's all about knowing more. And if that was true, the book of Romans would have stopped at chapter 11. Boy, there's more than we could ever get our intellectual arms around from just those 11 chapters, but Paul's not done yet. Why? Because God did not write the scriptures for us for our information. He had no need to inform us. His goal was to transform us. And that's why chapter 12 opens with these words, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Boy, friends, get what Paul's saying. Don't pat yourself on the back because you have all the answers. Recognize that what God's looking for is not that we have all of the information that has preceded this, but in fact, the transformation that's made possible by that. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. We're talking about generosity today, and we're going to talk about it in the context of the way it shows up in practical, measurable terms. It has to do with our money. You say, oh gosh, I've come to church and they're going to talk about money. They must always talk about money. Well, the truth is we seldom talk about money. But if you came to hear Jesus 2,000 years ago... Uh, some have done the calculation, and 25% of the red-letter parts of the Gospels have to do with money. Jesus brought it up all the time. Do you know why? His audience were workplace Jews. He didn't speak on the Sabbath because um, he didn't have a platform there. He, when he got to the t went to the temple, he always got in trouble. So most of his ministry happened out in the marketplace. In a Jewish marketplace in the first century, what do you think they were t thinking about? Money. Same thing that they think about in your world, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're thinking about money, how to get it, how to spend it, how to save it, how to invest it. But there's all kinds of um, time spent in our lives talking about money. Where did you learn what to do with money? I, I was raised in what today the demographers would call uh, working poverty. My dad always had a job but never had any money. And our family didn't have any money, and they didn't have anything to teach. And so at our family table, no one learned anything about money. My brother and my sister still live in working poverty. But God allowed me to discover, not at home around the family table, but in the family of God around the Bible, to find out the best input about money comes from the Bible, not the Wall Street Journal or Kiplinger. God's got a better perspective about everything. And if God's got anything to say about anything, find out from him first before you consult any other experts. Well, how are we doing with this money thing? The surveys are done almost annually. And here's the bottom line. And this is found through IRS reports. It's as true as the um, tax returns that come in. Judge that for yourself. But the average American gives 2% of what they make to charity. The average American Christian gives 2% of what they make to charity. The difference between us and people who don't have our faith is what we give to. But here's the tragedy. There's no calculated difference among people who confess to be Christians in America. There's no calculated difference between us and them. We are conformed to the pattern of this world as it regards generosity. God says, be transformed, be different, have such an incredibly better model that when the world sees you, they'll say they're not ordinary, they're extraordinary. And without any apology, that's our pursuit today. No better voice in that conversation than that of the Lord Jesus. And the first great address of his three-year ministry is found in what we call the Sermon on the Mount if you have a paper scripture with you, you can go to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to consult this a few times. Because in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus laid it out very clearly in verse 24. Listen to what he said. No one can serve two masters. 
Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Some translations render money as mammon. He's not talking about the paper or coin in your pocket or purse. He's talking about money taking on a spiritual demeanor. Now, it's interesting that for 1,500 years, the Jews had lived in the promised land, and God, Jehovah, had asked them to worship him with faithfulness and fidelity. And whenever the Jews got off the bubble and fell into um, fallback and disrepute with God, they submitted to the worship of the Canaanites around them, which were the gods Baal and Asherah. Depicted in stone and wood, stone is just stone and wood is just wood until you worship them. And when you worship them, they become de facto gods, little g gods. Not gods by nature, but gods by worship. You get the picture? They would worship the false gods rather than the true God. Here comes Jesus setting in motion the new covenant. And as he lays out the groundwork in the Sermon on the Mount, here's what he says. The competition is no longer between God and Baal and Asherah. That's the old days. Here are the new days. Who's the God of this age? It's mammon. It's no longer stone and wood. It's paper and ink. It's bills and coins. It, no man can serve two masters. Here's what Jesus says. Who's calling the shots in your life? God or money? When you come on the financial decisions of your life, is it God's direction that you follow? Or is money sort of setting the course, calling the shots, telling you when you can say yes and when you can say no? Wow, that's too practical. Let's move on. It's astounding that in that same passage a few verses before in chapter 5, verse 19, here's what the king of heaven said. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was coming to declare that the kingdom of heaven was being disclosed, was being announced by his presence as the Messiah. His kingdom is now in formation. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. It hasn't come yet. It will come the day that the king returns and he establishes his throne and he reigns over his righteous kingdom forever and ever. Are you looking forward to that? I am. Until then, watch this. The kingdom is recruiting citizens to be ready to welcome the return of the king. And as we do that, let me just say to you, friends, this is a tryout for our part in the coming kingdom. We are citizens in that kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. We didn't earn it, didn't work to deserve it. We, there's no claim we could be making to demand salvation from God. It came as a gift. Are you grateful for that? Yeah, I am too. Could I give it a little American model here? Salvation is Ellis Island. In the old days, immigrants came to America through Ellis Island, an island in the New York Harbor, and it was the first place you stopped to check in. I've visited 65 countries, and um, when I get outside of America and someone finds out you're an American, what's their immediate assumption? You're rich, because everybody in America is rich, aren't they? Well, we live in America. Is everybody rich? No. We're all Americans, but when you get here, discover that there's a system in which some are great and some are least, some are top, some are low. America's a great environment, well, let me just say that Jesus said, if you're a citizen of his kingdom, you've come through Ellis Island because the gift of salvation made you a citizen of his kingdom. The next question is, where will you be in that kingdom? Will you be great or will you be least? To be great in the American system means that you've got power, money, or both. To be great in the kingdom means that you've been obedient those who follow my commands, he said, and 
model that for others will be great in my kingdom. Those who disregard my commands and say, yeah, but, you know, that doesn't really work in the real world. You know, somebody else is calling the shots in terms of what the best approach is here. I'll consider that, but no. <laughs> Jesus said, here it is. It's binary. It's yes or no. Do you do what he commands or do you not? The more you're obedient, the higher your position, the less you're obedient, you'll still be a citizen, but expect in the eternal kingdom to spend your days saying, would you like fries with that? And you know, he get, went so far as to say people who were king of the hill in this age would be people who on that side would say, do you want regular or decaf? Boy, it brings to mind, and if you're there in Matthew 5, flip back about eight pages to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is a great finishing touch on the Old Testament. He's called a minor prophet. Don't call him that when you meet him. Hmm. I look at Malachi and I think immediately of my wife. You say, is she Malachi? No. I've been married for 48 years, and it took me about 20 years to discover that when my wife says, we need to talk, for the first 20 years or so, I thought, well, great, speak up, Bob. <laughs> no, 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 no. When my wife says, we need to talk, let me say what she really means. Shut up and listen. <laughs> Malachi is God speaking through a prophet saying, we need to talk. And what it really means is shut up and listen. Because Malachi has seven significant exceptions to a healthy relationship that the Jews were responsible for. God basically said, folks, I got a bone to pick. In fact, I got seven bones to pick. And one of those bones is in chapter 3, beginning at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. Stop there for a moment. Some of us are so um, in love with the New Testament that we believe that the Old Testament is um, fallen into dispute uh, and disregard and it doesn't need to be regarded. Well, let, let me just take exception to that. When God says in his opening line, I, the Lord, do not change. This isn't just a statement that has validity looking back. It's a statement that has validity looking forward. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Even since the time of your ancestors, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Now the conversation is going on between God and people, but what God is saying is, I know what you're going to say, so I'm going to write it in for you. That's the conversation here. God says, you've left me, return, and I'll return to you. But you ask, how, do, how are we to return? Then God says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? God answers, in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, your whole nation because you're robbing me. Now, it's important that we understand what Jesus um, would say in the Sermon on the Mount, what God is saying through Malachi, that they come together in a powerful way. Talking about tithes and offerings, there are, those are two very different things. Let, let me make clear what he said in that passage is capturing what all devout Jews knew. The tithe was not even in question. It was binding across all people, across all tribes, across uh, all times. The tithe is the first 10%. And get this, folks, we're talking about generosity today, but how do you get to generosity? It begins with faithfulness. The tithe was established as an expectation that God would say, here's the way it works. Everything in your hand came from me. All that we have came from God. Just imagine for a moment, you've got a $100 bill in your hands. Where did it come from? It comes from God. And God says, Here's the, here is the deal that we're making. I put the $100 in your hands. You give me 10 back. It's called the tithe. And when you do that, you are demonstrating faithfulness, not generosity. 
48 years ago, Sherry and I stood in front of Bob Scott, our pastor, and we um, took vows with each other, and I vowed to be faithful to my wife until we died. It's a non-negotiable. Years ago, I bought her a Glock 40 caliber. I'm accountable. That'll be edited out. Um, when, I, when I meet my vow, I don't expect a, a special commendation from my wife. You know, when I come home and say, Sherry, I've been gone for a week. I had that conference I did in Denver. I was in Albuquerque for the board meeting, and I spoke, and I was faithful to you the whole time. Yeah? Why? She expects it. If she doesn't hear that, there's trouble. If I do that, no prize. Why? She expects me to be faithful. Friends, to tithe is just the beginning point in our relationship with God. Why? He made it clear. Don't, don't call me Lord and then tell me no. Don't say, well, my, my finances won't allow for it. Well, then your finances are your God. No, God directed, he commanded it. And, and then I get the, well, you know, Jesus came to eliminate the law. Really? We'll touch that. But get what he says here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not... Throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much a blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I'll prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. God said, bring the tithe, which is the demonstration of your faithfulness, and then your offerings, which are the over and above, which shows your generosity, he said, do that to test me. You've heard this before. This is the only place in biblical history where God says, go ahead. You don't believe me? Try me out. Give it a shot. See if you can trust me. We already know I can't trust you. But see if you can trust me. And then here's his promise. I'll open the windows, the floodgates of heaven. There's only one other place in the Bible where that term is used. It's regarding the flood of Noah, which was not a little rain that kept the balloons down. It was an awesome deluge that covered the earth. Friends, God is prepared to prove that he can be trusted. <laughs> but he follows our proving that we can be trusted. You can't stare down heaven and say, you go first. Here's why. He already did. All that you have has come from God. Can he trust you? Boy, the process of becoming extraordinary begins with being informed. What we're hearing this morning, you won't hear on the outside. And friends, just know this. 24-7, we are deluged with messages about how to get rich, what we deserve, what we can spend, where we ought to save, what we could invest. We're deluged with messages everywhere we go about money. God says, you better be informed about the real truth, which is it isn't yours, it's his. And his expectations are different than any counsel you'll get anywhere else. Be informed. Second, be faithful. What's the beginning step in your relationship with God to be righteous According to David in the scriptures is to be generous and to be generous requires first that you be faithful. With my wife, for me to say I'm faithful doesn't win any prizes. But if I bring home flowers, that's generous. You with me? Over and above. It starts with faithfulness. Can he trust us with what we already have? And then there's gratitude. When we're grateful for the privilege of giving back to God, do you know what that unlocks? It unlocks the blessing of God. God designed the environment to be supported with water. And when there's water, things grow. And when things grow, we love it, don't we? 
the absence of water, we have a name for that, it's called drought. Do you know that in our relationship with God, the water is his blessing, the drought is his curse. What's a curse? God withholding the blessing that he wants to give. And when you live a parched life and say, well, who could afford to be faithful to God? Uh, God says, the reason you have no rain is because you have no faithfulness. What an amazing truth that to be grateful and then to be generous when his blessing comes out. Now, this is where we part ways with a very popular and growing trend among some who call themselves Christian, which is called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity folks are just fine up to the point of being faithful to give, but they give for the purpose of getting the blessing of God to spend it on themselves. Men and women, the reason God wants to bless us is so that we can bless others and be like God in righteousness by our generosity. And it is not generosity for me to spend on myself. It's generosity to benefit those whom God was generous with through himself and through his son. Well, when we become aware of that, we get back to Romans 12. We started a moment ago by the grace given to me in verse 3. I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. He says, don't, don't be impressed because you've got all the answers on your theology. Be impressed because you've put it in, into action and you're becoming more like God. And then Paul goes into a great conversation about how we function together. In verse 4, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Grace is unmerited favor. God's given us things by his sovereign choice, and he's distributed them to us by his design, not by our request. And then Paul gives a representative, though not comprehensive, list of spiritual gifts. What, what does that mean? There are other spiritual gifts mentioned in other parts of the New Testament, but these are representative of what he's talking about. If you have the gift of prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here's what Paul's saying. Life is lived in community, and when you're in community, there are things that need to be done. Now, my family has three generations, and my daughter's married with our six grandkids. They all live within walking distance. We are together. We don't get together for the holidays. We get together for the days. We're together frequently around the table, 12 of us. And let me tell you, when we're together, there's always going to be a need for some prophesying, some serving, some teaching, some encouraging, some giving, some leading, some showing mercy. And we're not stalled saying, does anybody have a spiritual gift? You know why? Because all of us are called upon to speak truth, to serve, to teach, to encourage, to give, to lead, to be merciful. We're all doing it because that's what families do, right? But from that we discover that some of those elements become so natural and powerful for us that when we come into the context of the family of God, the community of faith, there's some things that having been exposed in our family and relational life become our contribution to our kingdom life. That's evidence of our spiritual gifting. And here's a little clue. What God's gifted us to do spiritually probably is matched with what he's provided for us as a resource. Let me give you an example of that. This is a great church that has built, been built on faithful teaching of the word of God for decades. True? True. And it's been led by Pastor Skip and Linya and now Nate and other pastors who are providing great assistance to teaching the word of God. Here's how it works. All of us are called upon to teach truth to our kids, to our friends, in our relational pools. But there's some people who are extraordinary learners who read a passage in the scripture and get more from it than we do. And their research tells us, tells them 
what those who have processed that same truth in the past have learned from it, and they aggregate all of that incredible discovery, and then they keep it to themselves. And don't tell anybody what they now know. No, that's not true. Because when you have extraordinary learning, there's an assumption. You didn't learn it for your own benefit. You've learned it to benefit others. You know what's amazing? God links great learning with great teaching. If you have the gift of teaching, there's a pretty good chance that God's given you the capacity for learning that propels the teaching. True? Has anybody ever entered this building and left knowing more about God and his truth than they knew when they came? How many of you would not raise your hand to anything in a church because you wouldn't want to volunteer? Yeah. <laughs> See, you wouldn't be here if that was not your recurrent experience. You come expecting to learn from great teaching. Now get this. What if you're a person who doesn't have great learning but has great earning? What if you're a person who through the same 168 hours a week from the same 80 or 90 years of life what if you're the person who from the same kind of starting ground that the other people that were in your high school graduating class started from, you've ended up with a huge pile of resources? Well, the good news for you, it's all for your own use. Can you imagine if Pastor Skip came out here on a Sunday morning and said, I learned some incredible things this week about God, and there's no way I'm going to tell you. We'd call him stingy. We'd call him anything but generous, wouldn't we? Here's how, here's how God works. He's given some people the capability to earn greatly. Why? Because he's given them the gift of giving. If you've been given the great teach of, uh, the gift of teaching, teach! The gift of showing mercy, show mercy! The gift of prophecy, speak truth! The gift of giving... Give generously. What, why? That's where the third piece comes in. The pursuit, the process. Here's the projection. Why is all of this important? Hear the word of God, Matthew chapter 6, the words of Jesus in verse 19. Do not. He didn't say, you know, it might not be a good idea. No, he said, do not. What do you read from that? Don't. Yeah, me too. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, and the markets can drop 1,600 points in a week. Wait for it. Wait for it. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Why? Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. In my um, young and on biblical days, I thought the offering was a place where you kissed your money goodbye. <laughs> and uh, you said goodbye forever. Put it in the envelope, have a moment of silence, but kiss a goodbye because it's gone. Boy, what an amazing truth that God wants us to know that the God of this world doesn't want us to believe. When you put something in the offering box, it's not kiss a goodbye, it's send it ahead. You're not saying goodbye forever. You're saying, I'll see you later. Because that offering box is, in fact, heaven's ATM. You're not making a gift. You're making a deposit. And the account that you have in the bank of heaven will not be compromised ever. It will never be reduced in value. There will never be a moment where thieves will break in and take away what should have been yours but disappeared it will be there, and in fact, heaven offers a 100 times return. Does your bank offer that today on savings? It's fascinating, that same voice, the Lord Jesus, a few months later in Luke chapter 16, says it with such unmistakable clarity that we have to be fools to walk away confused. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Uh, he, he said it simply. Let me reiterate what he's saying. 
Whatever worldly wealth we have is ours for a purpose. We are here temporarily. We will be in eternity permanently, right? I travel a lot, and when I travel abroad, always the question, are you going to exchange money here from your bank and get a lousy exchange rate? Are you going to exchange at a kiosk in the airport on the other end and get an even worse exchange rate? Or are you going to do it at an ATM in the country when you get there and get a little better exchange rate? Well, here's what Jesus is saying, real simply. Down here you have money. In eternity we have people. The currency of this life is money. The currency of eternity is people. So here's my advice. Jesus says... Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Or to put it in the terminology of the metaphor I'm using, convert your cash to people here before you leave. Because there are no ATMs on the other side. And when you convert your money to people who are in eternity because of the investment you made in the ministries that would introduce the free gift of salvation to you, to them, here's what happens you will be rich on the other side because of the people who are waiting to greet you and your power in eternity is found in how many people are waiting to greet you on the other side. That's too simple for us to be confused. And he goes on. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. But whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? The God who came out of eternity to commit to time to invite us to join him in eternity. Let me tell you the difference he paints between time and eternity, between the here and the now. What you have here is very little. He says that what you do with very little could result in you having much, depending on what you do. He says in this passage... Down here, we've been entrusted with worldly wealth. But based on what we do during this short tryout, it will determine whether we will someday receive what he calls true riches. We're working with the counterfeit stuff here. There's real wealth in eternity. But get this. Down here. It's someone else's. If you couldn't be trusted with someone else's property, who would give you property of your own? I lived for years with the misconception that I was a Christian capitalist serving a cosmic communist. That down here, it was private ownership, and I might decide to give a little bit to God, or I might not, but down here, it's all ours, and up there, it's all his. But when we got to heaven, God was going to be fair, which means like your mom with the cake, you know, everybody gets an equal slice. Well, let me just give you a little clue. God's not your mom, and he doesn't do equal slices. He said, I'm going to watch what you do down here with my stuff to decide when you get to my place how much will be your stuff. Down here, there is no private ownership. God owns it all. We're stewards. Up there, there is private ownership. What will you own in eternity? That's for you to decide. How do you decide that? Based on what you do with his stuff while you're here. And if you don't find that, on, that out until you get there, it will be too late. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, by the grace... God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. Someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, and straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. 
Here's the way Paul describes your life and mine. Your faith is the foundation that has been poured and is solid and will take you to heaven. Have you ever seen the devastation of a neighborhood that has been taken down by an inferno? Magnificent homes before, but now ash and concrete slabs. Paul says, I poured the slab, you're building your life. And every day you're making decisions between wood, hay, and straw, or gold, silver, and precious stones. The end of your life, the fire of God's judgment, will test the quality of what you did. Paul says, I'm done, and what I did gets you to heaven. What you'll do will determine what happens when you get there. Every decision of our lives is between wood, hay, and straw that burns, or gold, silver, and precious stones that are refined but have value eternally. Get this, the fire of God's judgment will test the quality. If it survives, you receive a reward. If it burns up, you suffer loss. You'll still be saved, but as through fire. <clears throat> Friends, let me make it real clear today. We're talking about generosity, but you can't be generous if you're not first faithful. Generosity shows up in our offerings. Faithfulness shows up in our tithes. I can't jump to offering and miss the tithe. The tithe is the beginning point. It proves that we can be trusted by God. And then generosity proves that we're grateful to God. Why would I even want to do that? Because the impact of that will be felt by me in eternity and the people who will be in eternity because the decisions that I made. The last words of Jesus, do you know where they're found? Some say Matthew 28 with the Great Commission. No. Some say Acts 1 with the ascension. No. Do you know where the last words of Jesus are? They're in the last chapter of the last book. It's on the last page. It's in Revelation 22. Let me quote Jesus. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every person according to what they've done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. In other words, no more communications between now and the time you see me coming back. Friends, why are we talking about generosity? Because we want to live rich, but we want to be rich tomorrow. Your reward in heaven will reflect your generosity on earth. God, that is not the news we woke to in our culture. It's not the belief that frames the people who are ordinary Christians. We think of the contrast between the generous and the stingy, and we think of our friends who are generous and long to be with them. God, um, thank you for being the generous God. Thank you for calling us into generosity. Thank you for giving us the model to follow. And thank you for the moments when we make the best decisions about being, reflecting the character of God in our generosity and believing that its impact benefits us today. Generous people are happy people. But someday, generous people will be great people, rewarded, elevated, close to the heart of God in this lifetime, elevated in the kingdom of God in the time that will never end. God, I pray for these, my friends in Albuquerque, that their generosity would make them extraordinary in their culture, in their community, and that from it, you'll be glorified. In your great name we pray. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.